Welcome back to A Lifetime of Mafia Tales. Today, Sal and I talk about the sixth Mafia hitman that he was close to. The name of the hitman was Charles Carniglia, also known as Charlie Carnig. Charles was a made man in the Gambino crime family under John Gotti. It is alleged that Charles was a hitman for none other than John Gotti himself. One particular hit that stood out to me and Sal was that Charles was alleged to be involved with the murder slash kidnapping of John Gotti's son, Frankie Gotti's killer. Charles had a brother named John Carniglia as well, who was a very serious man in the mob. Sal talks about business dealings with Charles Carniglia, and he would also find out that he was a serial killer. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to get more videos like this. Also, please be sure to subscribe to our Patreon channel, more exclusive content from me and Sal. We'll talk about a story about Charles that can't be talked about on YouTube because they might take it down. One quick thing before we get started with this podcast. If you want to get our full podcast, please subscribe to our Patreon channel. Our Patreon channel link is in the video description below all right we're back so how you okay. doing this morning good morning good yeah well good morning to you too man today's yeah. going to be another interesting episode we're going to be talking about i believe the sixth hitman now charles carniglia he right. was uh he would go on to be a made man in the gambino family i don't know if he was made when you knew him do you know <clears throat> uh you know what after i left which was 1980 five i didn't pay much attention to uh the structure and who was made and who wasn't made i just you know the government put me out in texas and i was like in a bubble out there uh, right. you know, yeah, yeah news okay. hardly this is before we had internet so news hardly ever made any uh <laughs> mention of what was going on in new york uh in 85 until uh castellano was whacked out christmas time in 85 so yeah, I didn't no. pay. I didn't pay attention. I didn't talk. I didn't ask questions to FBI agents and investigators and U.S. attorneys. That they weren't interested in sharing their information anyway. They just don't do that. Right. Okay. Well, I, from what I researched, um, you know, I got a lot of my information from Tony DiStefano's book about Charles Carneglia, and so that's where I'll be basing a lot of my information on today. And I mean, he joined the Gambinos and. 1972 under Carmine and Danny Fatico and one of their early busts was that Charles and John were busted for hijacking and they were you know pinched and that was the first mafia pinch but you know he worked his way up into being close with Gotti he was gotten his crew and he became a hitman for him and I mean he did a you know he was involved with a lot of uh murders that we'll get into today I mean when he was indicted for you know his Rico stuff there was Murders of like Albert Galb, Michael Cotiliano, Sal Puma, uh, Louis De Bono, uh, Jose Rivera. I mean, there was a lot of them, man. And I yeah. don't know how, how many he was actually convicted of, but there was. I mean, that's just you know the, the you know one Rico charge that they had against right. him. Right. But so I mean, what? What uh, I guess, where do you fit in with all this? Where did you meet Charles? What year? I met I met him at the Bergen in, in the early seventies. Okay, uh, early seventies. Foxy, Foxy and I were doing hijackings. I met him there, but I wasn't really involved with him. Um, I didn't pay much attention to what he was doing. Uh, then when I went to jail, it's Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary. I was in jail with his brother John Caniglia, who. After I got out in 75, uh, John had gotten out in 74. He got out October, and I got out September 75. I immediately uh, was involved with Cataldo with the drugs, but, you know, never talked about drugs with any of those guys. It, it was very secretive with Cataldo. But I did run into John Caniglia, and uh, I opened up a Corvette shop, and while I was having these Corvettes restored, I had another building where I was chopping cars. So I started to supply John Caniglia with a lot of cars, maybe, I don't know, five or 10 cars a week. And then uh, also ran into jo uh, Charles at Fountain Auto. That was the name of their business, Fountain Auto Parts. And occasionally I'd go there and... John Caniglia would ask me if I could take checks. 
And I had several bank accounts. So, you know, in those days, you could get away with depositing anybody's checks. Nobody checked on him. I would take his corporate checks or whatever checks because he was he had a legitimate auto business there where he sold parts. So they would chop cars there also. And then I would run into Charles every once in a while. So that was 70, oh, 76, 77. On one particular occasion, I had talked to Charles about um, how would I get a key made for an older GM car? And back then in the 70s, even in the 60s, I believe the car I was interested in was a 68 Pontiac. And I said to him, you're pretty slick with, with cars and locks. If I brought you a lock, could you make a key for it? And in those days, we knew that the GM cars had two keys when the car was issued, when it was a brand new car. And one key, I believe, fit the ignition and the door. And the other key fit the trunk and the glove box. And I said to him, or vice versa, I, I, it might have been the key that was in the glove box fit fit the door or the trunk. I'm not sure. But nevertheless, he said, yeah, bring me the lock. I'll make you a key. This was like in 76. I remember because it was a bicentennial year and I was messing around with this girl and she loved jewelry. And I had got information from Cataldo that him and Jackie Donnelly went to heist the jeweler in Brooklyn in a, in a nice neighborhood. The jeweler was uh, out of 47th Street, worked for a wholesaler. And around, you know, the summer, maybe the end of the summer or September, he would hit all these jewelry stores all over Long Island that were high dollar stores. And he had this large case with wheels on it. And he would go to the jewelry store and sell these jewelers, jewelry stores, wholesale jewelry. So I had followed the guy and Cataldo said to me, you know, we, we blew that guy. We were going to heist him. And somebody saw the gun when Jackie, Con Jackie um, Donnelly approached the driver's side and screamed. And then we had to run off and we never got that guy. But Dominic saved his name and address. So it was like, I, I think it might have been September. I started to go follow this guy. And I realized he had a very specific route and a habit. He would leave Long Island where he lived. He would drive to the Queens Criminal Court. And under the Queens Criminal Court, there was a large parking facility. And the reason he would park there is because you could put like six or eight quarters in the meter and that would hold you over for like the whole day. At that point in the 70s, you know, you might have got two or three hours per quarter. So he would put, uh, you could see how much time was on the meter and you could see it was like eight hours. So he would go to, to the jewelry exchange at nine or 10 o'clock in the morning and go back to get his car by taking the subway at maybe four or five in the afternoon. And then I started to clock him with another guy. I had this friend of mine who was really good at uh, stealing cars, he came with me and we clocked him. And I told Cataldo, I think I could, I think I could get this guy with his jewelry. He asked me, how are you going to do it? I said, I'm going to get his key to his car, key to the, to the trunk. And Dominic said, well, how are you going to do that? I said, I know a guy that can make keys off of locks. And that was Charles. He could get a, a, a a, a, a lock like from the uh, glove box and it had numbers on it and you knew how to you know make a key for that lock now once I had the key for that lock then I had the key for the trunk so I followed this guy for weeks every week and the interesting thing about him was I would go and he his route was every day park his car underneath the Queens Criminal Court building and I would go look at his car because I had his plate number and I knew the car was a green Pontiac. And I could see that he was he was um, prepared to pick up the car four or five o'clock in the afternoon by putting all his quarters in. But one of the things he did do, because he was pretty, you know, pretty chintzy in a way, he only put in two quarters on Friday. 
which meant he only had four hours worth of time for the car to be parked there. And that meant that he took the subway from Queens to Manhattan to the jewelry district, picked up his bag, took the subway back. And so he saved like a dollar or whatever it was every Friday because he was so cheap. And uh, he had that, you know, that big jewelry case. It looked like like a piece of luggage, but it was all jewelry and, and you know, had wheels on it. So we we followed him two or three times. And, and then I had a friend of mine who was a thief down on 47th Street, the jewelry exchange. And I asked him if he knew about the company that he worked for. Because I had everything on this guy. I had his name. I ran his plate number. I knew his name. I knew where he worked. And the guy that I asked said, oh, yeah, that guy handles high-dollar jewelry. Expensive. He has a line of expensive jewelry. So when it came for the day for me to have this guy, Vinny, break into the car and get the lock out of the glove box, we bought a lock to replace the lock we stole out of the glove box. So the guy got in the car, Vinny, and took the lock out of the glove box, put the lock in that we had. That was only for show because we just needed that lock for like one day. So then we took the lock to Charles. He made a key for us. Then we went back and we stuck the lock, the original lock back in the glove box. And we tried the key that Charles made and it opened up the trunk. The <laughs> following, following week, we went back and we followed this guy. And we had it laid out that he would go to this Jewish deli and get a pastrami sandwich on Friday. That's what he would do. Mm -hmm. uh, he would do a couple of stops, you know, his regular route. And then it would be in Long Island, you know, where it was kind of ritzy and the North Shore was high dollar jewelry stores. And I figured, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to let him have his lunch. And then, you know, we'll, we'll glom, we'll glom the box, the jewelry box <laughs> out of his trunk. But the problem was he was sitting in the front by the window and he parked his car there, you know, so he could see the car from where he was in the, in the, in the deli. So I decided I got this gal who was real sexy and I would get her to go in there and distract him. Finally, after a couple of weeks, he didn't sit by the window, but he sat, you know, close, but he couldn't see his car. So there he was. And I sent this girl in and she was like, you know, wagging her tail and stuff. And he, he spotted her by that time. My friend Vinny took the key, went, opened up the trunk, took the box and rolled the box around the back of the, the strip center and threw it in my car and off we were. So that was uh, interesting. We took the jewelry and we divided it up. Some of those pieces were marked. They were all marked how much they were, $500, mm -hmm. $1,000 each. That was some high dollar jewelry. <clears throat> and there was a lot of chains and pearls and all kinds of stuff. So I took that jewelry and went back and met my my girlfriend, and I tied her up in the bed with the jewelry around her ankles and wrists. And that particular experience led uh, us to put that scene in the Sinatra Club movie. <laughs> yeah, so that did actually happen. <laughs> yeah, and of course, Cataldo was amazed that we pulled that off. You know. Yeah, um, I mean that yeah. is really interesting. I mean, so you guys. All divided it up. Do you remember how much you even got from your? your yeah, show? I don't really remember, but I know it was a pretty good amount. There was three of us involved. Uh, it was just me, Vinny, and another guy. And you know, some of the stuff was expensive, but in those days, I just flipped it to get the money. You know, there was a lot of high dollar jewelry. I went back and told Cataldo I gave him a couple of watches or something, and you know, we made a good score for Christmas, and. Um, I think I went back and gave Charles like a couple of rings or something because he happened to like jewelry. But the jewelry he liked, he was taking off people that he was killing. And he hung up his jewelry in the back of the, the junkyard. So he had a little room back there and stuff. But, um, you know, I was really impressed that he made that key. And we, we got that. Without a gun, we, we pulled off a couple of hundred thousand dollar heist. So to me... <laughs> That was really something to do. And, of course, Cataldo didn't believe I could do it without heisting the guy. It was like a little bit of a sneaky sneak theft, you know. So sure. I gave John, uh, you know, I gave uh, Charles, I gave Charles some jewelry. 
and told him we pulled off this heist with his key. He was really excited about it, that he was able to help us do that. It was sort of a sneaky thing to do, but, you know, no gun involved and all that kind of stuff. Because once I got out of jail, I was, I was done with doing heist. This wasn't really like a heist to me in a sense. It was just, you know, a sneak, a sneaky uh, kind of robbery. Yeah, it really was. I mean, you didn't have to use anything. You just went up in there and got got a girl just like what, you know, we talked about, you know, Henry doing with Tommy Simone, I believe it was. They had a yeah. girl go and get next to the guy that was holding the goods. And, you know, yeah. they went in and made their move and, you know, yeah. Yeah. made a fake lock. But so Charles was pretty excited about that. So let's expand right. a little bit more on him. I mean. Yeah. After that, did you continue to do any business with them? Or Well, you know, occasionally I'd get guns from somebody stealing them, whether it was, uh, you know, from a freight company or whatever. And Giles, Giles was always interested in buying some guns off me. So I did, you know, I did give him, give him some guns. You know, I sold him some guns. And then he uh, approached me about buying some weed. And I said, yeah, you know, what, what was the price? I, I don't remember, but it was really a low price. In those days, I can't remember. You might have been able to get weed for twenty bucks a pound or something. Really, <laughs> twenty yeah. bucks, damn, yeah, something like that. And they would come in big bales right out of Colombia, and it'd be marked on the outside of the, the burlap bags. You know, like forty k, sixty k kilograms. So mm-hmm. it might have been seventy, eighty, ninety pounds, whatever it was. But I would meet Charles and give him the car that I had like a 70 something car because in the seventies, the trunks were still big after 78, they, they uh, shrunk the cars down and you couldn't put, but a couple of bales in a, in a, in a 79 car, you know, they had making the models of all the cars. GM were, were smaller, but I'd give him the car. He'd load it up with weed. Then I'd take the weed and give it to my brother-in-law because I wasn't really interested in weed because I didn't talk about, drugs to, to uh, Charles about heroin that I was it was still secretive with Cataldo. So the weed was like a, you know, a, sort of a lesser crime to be selling weed, but I didn't want any part of it. And I'd do that for my brother-in-law who was like 18, 19 years old and he would sell weed. Um, and then I'd run into Charles at one of the diners that he hung out. I think it was, uh, it was two diners that a lot of the Italian guys, mob guys in Howard Beach would go to. And one was the uh, Fountain Blue Diner in Howard Beach. Another one was called the Lindenwood Diner a few minutes away. And Charles would be there every morning having coffee and meeting whoever he could meet. You know, guys would have meetings and diners and, you know, talk about crime and all. (coughs) And the interesting thing about the diner that I used to go to, I knew one of the waitresses because her kid played football for me. And uh, she had introduced me to a couple of the gals. You know, I was always messing around with, you know, young, pretty women. They were waitresses. And then I found out that Charles was weird. Uh, One of the girls told me that she had been with this guy and he was, you know, a real sicko. He was a sadist. He would burn, burn a girl with cigarettes and all, you know, like really abuse use girls, you know, give them drugs and tie them down, all this kind of stuff. But I didn't pay much attention to it. That was in the 70s. Well, once I went into the program and I left New York, I never thought much about any of those guys. I was already in Texas in the program. Sometime in the uh, early 2000s, maybe three, 2003, three, four, five, something like that, I got a call from a uh, FBI agent friend and he says you know there's a couple of guys in New York that want to talk to you he said one is an FBI agent the other one is a homicide detective okay so give them my number so they call me and they arrange a meeting in San Francisco by the airport so it's like a Monday morning I go to this meeting we sit down and what happens in these meetings when uh, investigators are focused on somebody First, you start out talking about all these people that were around the subject until you finally realize, oh, the subject is Charles Coniglia, you know, about the neighborhood and who knew who. But by, through my FBI report and all the work I had already done in the Gotti trial and everything else, they knew 
that I knew Charles Coniglia well. I wasn't involved with him on a daily basis with crime. You know, I was in the car business with his brother, stolen cars, chop shops. But I did, you know, get involved with Charles a little bit. But what I knew was he was the sicko with girls. And so when I sat down with these two detectives from New York, one was a homicide detective, the other was an FBI agent, they were working the case that they were going to bring against Charles, which I knew nothing about. And I told him about my experiences and I, it was like a Monday morning. And I said, you know, I can't remember the name of the girl who was the, the waitress because the name started to just leave me after years, 10, 15, 20 years. Just, unless somebody brought up a name and an experience, you wouldn't think about who the uh, waitress was and who, who worked for her. She was like managing young, young girls in this, this high volume, you know, diner. So I went back on Monday afternoon. They said, how about meeting one more time on Tuesday or Wednesday, like a day later? So I, you know, went home. I went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, I woke up and I remembered the girl's name. Out of the blue, I remember her name. Just like and, that. <laughs> yeah. And I went back and I said to the FBI agent and the homicide guy, the guy uh, was the homicide guy was Steve Kaplan, his name was. Really nice guy. And that's when the first year I had met him, which was a couple of years maybe before the trial. I think the trial took place in, in 09 or something. I wasn't paying attention. But, and I said, look, this is the name of the waitress. And I gave them the name. That day I left. I didn't hear from them for years. Then as I was doing the movie Sinatra Club in 2009, the guy Kaplan called me and said, hey, I'm going to be in L.A. I'd like to visit you. So I said, I'm going to be working on the movie. I'll be at the set. But, you know, we got a day off on whatever day it was because you work six days on movies, one day off, six <laughs> on, one off. Yeah. And uh, he came to the house and we sat down. We had coffee or something. And he says, you know, we're going to bring Charles to trial. And I just want to tell you how much we appreciate you remembering the name of that waitress. <clears throat> and I said, did you find the girls that he, you know, abused? The one He was a satanic guy, man. I don't know. He did all kinds of torture to these girls. He says, we did. And they're going to testify, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. I never heard much about, about the case. I didn't follow it. But I heard he got convicted. And that was like in uh, 2009 or 10 or something. Well, a couple of years later when... Uh, Michael Franzese and I did the promotion for Inside the American Mafia for National Geographic. Uh, they took us to a, on a couple of city tour. And as we got to Philadelphia, they took us to this popular Italian restaurant. And they had a whole group of, of writers there. And one of the writers was that guy, Tony DiStefano. Yeah. And, and that book, I don't know, I think the book had already come out. I'm not sure. This was maybe 2012. And I did talk to that guy, DiStefano, a little bit. But I about didn't his know. book about Charles, right? Yeah, we talked yeah. a little bit about Charles. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of information about him. He was just a sicko. I tried to stay away from guys like that who were who were sadistic, you know, uh, hurt hurt women, hurt girls. I just, you know, I didn't have any, any, re any reason to do any business with him after, you know, after I left New York. But, of course, that was so long. Before that, I mean, I met uh, Di Stefano in 2012. All this stuff happened in the 70s and 80s. But yeah. that was my experience with him. And I read a lot about, you know, about his, his trial and he was convicted of uh, the interesting thing. <clears throat> the interesting thing, I think, was that the court officer that he supposedly murdered, he was on trial for that murder. He never got convicted for that. Albert Gelb murder, no. and the family was really disappointed. I read that, but he was convicted on other murders. Yeah, um, a lot of them. I mean, and that's what I'll go into. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, from like I said, the research that I did through Tony's book. I mean, the you know there there was even informants that would uh, you know testify that he was involved with the killings and stuff like that. 
And in Tony's book, he talks about Mikey Scars. I mean, a lot of people know he's out now doing shows. And John A. Light, they testified against him. Um, I, I, from what I wrote, I said, you know, Mikey knew about one murder. Charles did for sure. He said it was Louis DeBono. Mikey got this information from Sammy the Bull. And really? Then, yeah, that, that's that's what I read in Tony's book. So, you know, uh, another one was another hitman that we're going to be talking about as well. Quentin, you know, he was named Peter Sicuro, and he right. became an informant against Charles and told the court about the murders that he knew Charles did, the Albert Gelb, Salvatore Puma, and Louis DiBono. So, I mean. Yeah, Charles, I had introduced Charles to quite a few guys when I had the chop shops in 76, 77. He was really young. He was 21, 22. And I did teach Peter Zaccaro how to cut heroin, and I supplied him heroin for a while. You know, we made money. Um, he was an interesting guy. I didn't think he was a kind of a tough guy. I didn't think he would ever flip, but I guess he got tired of the life. Yeah. And I think uh, he looked up to John Gotti, and Gotti disappointed him. Yeah. By the way, he, he went public with, with the life. Yeah, that's what I was reading the other day. So yeah. we'll, we'll cover him. We'll do a whole episode on on Peter Sicaro. Yeah. But yeah. Another guy that did become an informant that has a show now as well against Charles was uh, Anthony Ruggiano Jr. He provided the government with stories about Charles. I don't believe he was directly involved with Charles like that, but, for you know, just, you know, heard from information, you know, secondhand yeah. information mm -hmm. kind of deal. But you know, uh, Charles, when he was on trial as well, he was known for messing with jurors and tampering with them, making them scared. I mean, he would, they would, uh, even in one of the cases, Charles went to court and all the jurors were hidden. You know, the given, really? Char given Charles history with apparently killing jurors and stuff and tampering with them, they, uh, they just put, I hit him, I guess. I, I don't know. I've never heard of that, but that's, <laughs> you know, that's something really different that, uh, you know, given his history, man, they knew he was brutal. Well, he he was on the first Gotti Rico trial, mm -hmm. but he, he didn't appear. He was on the lamb, from what I remember. He was <laughs> oh, okay. one of the defendants, so I don't know. How many trials did he have? He's had to have a lot. I mean, quite a few, not just one, I would assume. Yeah. And let's see. Let's go back to, uh, you know, Charles, when he, he became a made guy, this was after his first one with that whole, I think he was acquitted for the murder of Albert Gow, Gelb, the state officer, the court officer. He was, he became a made guy after right. that. It all kind of happened at the same time. But then there was another incident as well with, uh, you know, murder that had taken place. And again, this is what information came out of Tony's book, um, Robert Engel, and e Eagle, I'm, I believe I'm saying that right. He went and Charles... He wanted Charles dead because Charles killed his friend Michael Quintilio. I didn't it, know those guys. I mean, well, there was a whole yeah. group that I didn't know. I think Charles had a whole bunch of young guys. I, he must have followed him, as far as I remember. Right. I mean, because this even involves John Gotti. Well, it talks about John Gotti in here too. Because, well, anyways, they had to sit down for this, and since Charles was under John Gotti's Bergen crew, and Michael was underneath uh, the Carrazzo faction. Both sides had representatives, representatives at the sit-down. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it was actually supposed to be, you know, Anthony Ruggiano's father who was supposed to be at the meeting. But the Carrazzo, he was new into this whole he, – he just became new and he wanted to, you know, get his beak wet into, you know, handling family disputes and stuff. But, you know, it, Robert Angles really wanted – <clears throat> Robert Ingalls wanted him dead, but, you know, Gene Gotti, the younger brother of the, you know, of John Gotti sat down with the Carrazzo faction and decided what would happen. And, you know, basically Charles would get a, you know, pass on this, but, you know, after that, the death, you know, nobody wanted to, uh, I don't know. They didn't really want to take any action. They said Charles was too, uh, too valuable at that point to yeah well if he was around. cutting people up and putting them in in drums of acid i guess that was they they had a use for him yeah you know they had a use for him so yeah and you know like we talked to i mean i think you went to john charles they they owned carniglia they owned they're both 
their junkyard. And did you, right. you went there, right? I mean, oh yeah. I was there all the time on Fountain Avenue. It was right mm -hmm. just a few blocks from the Fountain Avenue city dump. <clears throat> they had this huge operation and that was in the seventies. But uh, when I decided to leave New York city and move upstate New York, I actually sold John Caniglia two commercial buildings and two houses with just a few blocks from their fountain auto parts. And uh, that was an interesting uh, transaction because it was all cash. You know, I sold it for a couple of hundred thousand dollars. What they did with that property, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm sure it was only, God, it was only two blocks from the junkyard. So I'm mm -hmm. sure they had a use for it. Yeah, I would imagine. <clears throat> and so Charles, he also had these trophies in this junkyard area and that there was like a shed or something, right? Right. So what do you know from your knowledge? I don't know much about that shed. I mean, I didn't pay attention to that. I mean, I was quick. I was do business and go. That was it. I wasn't <laughs> interested in idle chat. No. Chatting. Yeah. Just, well, okay. What are we doing here? Let's, uh, <laughs> let me give you the money for the weed, you know, whatever it was. And that was it. And after a while, I didn't even meet him at the, at the <clears throat> Fountain Auto Parts. I'd meet him at the diner, give him the money. I don't remember how long it went on, but it probably went on for six months. I was giving my brother-in-law, you know, marijuana, pot, right. large, large bales. Because in those days, I was only interested in selling heroin. There was more money to me in heroin than, than weed. And my brother-in-law used to pick up money for me. I had customers and I'd say, Hey, go meet these certain customers and get, get a thousand from this one, 500 from here, you know, whatever it was every week. I had three or four customers that he knew that he would cover for me. So I didn't have to go out and pick up the money. Yeah. Well, I guess you had your helpers just like, it seems like Charles did too. I mean, so just to, you know, expand on that, the whole trophy deal from what I read in Tony's book, it said that, um, Charles had a piece of jewelry from each victim hanging in the shop. Really? Whatever he could get off of them, I guess. Yeah. I mean, and then just another sick thing. And there was, there was this one incident. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but he would dip acid on two guys feet. He didn't kill them, but there was an incident that had went down at Charles family's house. They were having a party and there was a, a report of gunshots and that someone had been murdered. John Carniglia wanted whoever, did this to be dealt with. So Charles was on the hunt for this. And I believe John was in prison. That's, you know, and so Charles went and he had, he had found out who the few kids that were involved with it. He tied them up and put acid on their feet. And then he poured, I mean, he would just, you know, put it on there. Just, I don't know how exactly how he did it, but he even was reported to film it as well. And he really, would get rid of it. And he, yeah, and he told these kids that he was going to put it up their, you know, their ass. And so they gave him the information, the name, and it turned out to be one of Charles's nephews. So he got rid of the evidence and, you know, got rid of the tape and everything and let everything go. But really, yeah, I was pretty disturbed when I read that. I was like, holy. Well, yeah, he was a sadist. He was a real sadist. He abused women. That's what I knew. By that time, I had stayed away from the guy. I mean, I just didn't associate with people who, hurt women or children. It was just not, I didn't have an interest. No, in I, no, no, no way, man. That's something that's a whole nother level, a yeah. whole nother sick level, man. And so John A. Light, he was uh, from what, again, when I read Tony's book, he was involved with Charles's crew. And when John A. Light joined his crew, uh, Charles gave John A. Light a machine gun telling him he needed to watch his back because John Gotti Jr. had put a hit on his head. Really? And, <laughs> yeah, so there's another uh, interesting piece of history. If no was this in the 80s or 90s, or I'm not sure the exact year on this, wow. but it had to have been early, early on yeah. because John. <clears throat> yeah, I had never even met that John A. Light. John A. Light. No, after the that, life though, you didn't. No, the guy Steve Kaplan asked me to talk to him once, uh -huh. and I talked to him on the phone, and uh, he was trying to go straight. And then he called me another time. He asked me to go on his podcast, but I didn't want to bother. I just, I didn't think I had anything in common with, with that guy, John. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, I mean, Charles was just something else, man. He was just really different. And he, it was uh, also said that he didn't like John Gotti Jr. You know, that was the acting boss. I mean, he didn't totally hate him, but it was said that, you know, this young guy being the boss and, 
just the way that he, how he was acting and portraying himself. Charles yeah. just didn't like it apparently. Yeah. But, I, but I, from what I heard from the from law enforcement, he was a very sick, demented killer. Mm -hmm. And I was sorry to hear that because, I mean, there was a lot of guys that were bad, you know, bad, bad actors, you know, like Casso and these guys were, you know, treacherous killers. <clears throat> but I didn't get involved with any of that stuff. I wasn't interested in murder. It never was. It was yeah. to me, there was no purpose in murdering people. I mean, these were guys that were caught up in this lifestyle of like the mob being, you know, uh, you know, something special in their life above their family and their children. Uh, I didn't see it that way. I just didn't see surrendering your body and soul to some mobster and having them tell you what to do. That wasn't something I was interested in. No. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I mean, what eventually led up to Charles being busted, it was, it was just, he was doing extortion. He, he was shaking down a guy, I didn't believe a tax broker or, you know, something like that. And, you know, for $400 a month, it wasn't nothing big, but this was what would eventually uh, Charles would get $5 or five years from prison for extortion. And, you know, after he got out of prison, he would, you know, continue to be watched by the feds. But, you know, so that's really when they started to pursue him and know who he was and who, who he was affiliated with. And, I mean, they, they, they wanted him. And if they were going to get him – for anything they, they try to do anything and you know they got him for shaking down someone for 400 bucks a month but but from what i remember when steve kaplan that homicide detective <clears throat> visited me uh it had to be in 03 or 4 or 5 something like that they waited years before they arrested him and took him to trial uh he got convicted i think in 09 or something like that yeah because i mean he uh let's see from tony's book as well I mean, the day that they arrested him, you know, I believe the last time was he was at his mother's house. And this is what happened. I mean, Charles was he was his mother's caretaker. And he I mean, so he was staying with her and the feds busted into the house and they broke in the door. There was all kinds of different officers there, even a cold case detective as well. They figured he was going to help solve some cases that weren't solved yet i mean so this guy was looking all over charles's house and just trying to get any evidence on anything but i mean they they let charles kiss his mother goodbye and he was he told her he was going on vacation well his brother john was already going on vacation as well he was doing 50 years right so the feds wanted to search um charles's attic because he kept like you know looking up looking at it or just kind of like looking weird at it but they had no warrant, so they eventually just took him in, and that's when they brought him against all those, all those murders, all those wow. uh, that, that I had talked about at the beginning, the Albert Gal. Well, I don't think. Well, maybe they brought that one back up again, but I mean, he was already dropped of that. The Michael Cotillo, the Sal Puma, Louis De Bono. Um, well, he was sentenced to life. Did he get life? I think so because he he had to have uh, he's still alive. He's in prison from what I researched, and I mean the last known thing about him was in 2021 that he was still in prison. I mean, so he's still alive, but yeah. I'm not sure exactly. I mean, I would imagine he would have got life. He's got to be around your age, so yeah, he's he's about 77 by now. Yeah, He'll probably die in there, you know. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he. Uh, when he when they brought him in, so after they had brought him in from the his mother's house, he just the feds asked him about all these murders, and they told him like, "Hey, we know you did this. We know you did this to this guy. Uh, you know, in 1976, 1977, this guy," and he admitted that he knew one of the people. He didn't say he killed any of them, but he said that he knew them. But the funny thing was as well was that. They would bring up a guy and they would say how he died or something. And somehow Charles would know their the locations where these went down. Really? He, he didn't mean to uh, to confess that, apparently. So, I mean, I got a lot of this information from Tony's book. And I know Tony does a damn good job of uh, researching and stuff like that. So I'm just kind of reporting from what he said. <clears throat> yeah. But, yeah. You know, I mean, that's that's what was said, that he was kind of stumbling over and saying, Hey, this is where this location, you know, location went down. I mean, 
I don't know how it all went down, really. But, I mean, yeah, he definitely had to have gotten life in prison for all the stuff that he did. And there was a lot that he probably got away with. I'm I mean, sure. A lot of murders and stuff. Yeah. But there was a lot of guys that flipped on him. And, I mean, there's quite a few of them, actually, that uh, that did testify against him. They got shows now. Like I said, uh, Mikey Scars, uh, <laughs> uh, John A. Light, Anthony Ruggiano. And, you know, now yeah. here wow. you are. You knew him, too. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I just, you know, never had any, uh, I didn't have a good feeling about the guy. Once I heard about, you know, what he was doing to the to the young gals, the waitresses, you know, that bo- that bothered me because that was never part of my life. I never abused any women. I just, I didn't need to do that. But I think there was something sick inside his, his, uh, his mind about hurting women. I think so too. And just, I believe too, the, there was a murder that he did that was on, uh, you know, he went on a heist and there was a guy named Jose Rivera and he was an armor car driver and he was killed during the heist. He was shot twice with a shotgun, but I don't think Charles had to do that. Uh, he, of course he didn't have to, but I mean, he, he wanted to like, for whatever reason, he could have just ran away or got away. But you know, the guys he was with were like, you know, they could tell there was something wrong or they kind of were did, like, did they say who the other guys with him were? Mm, they had, maybe in the book it did, but I don't think I wrote it down. But they hadn't been. I would have th- assumed there would have been some Gambino guys. I don't know. Did he do that armored car heist with Peter Zaccaro? That could have been. Yeah. That could have been. Yeah, because I mean, where else would they have gotten this information? I mean, yeah. someone had to be. It had to have been one of the informants. Right. I mean, there's no way it could have just been some secondhand information. But yeah, I, I don't know, man. There was even there's one more thing that we could talk about about Charles, you know, before his brother went away, John, they had this big Father's Day party and they invited all kinds of different wise guys and stuff. And of course, the feds were out there taking pictures and trying to listen in and stuff. But him doing this, this was able, you know, for the feds to really, okay, well, these guys are together. They're somehow connected. So that's when they started watching all these other guys and stuff. So that was another thing that, you know, he did to where, you know, kind of got him in some trouble because now the feds were watching all of his associates and now they know the associates associates are yeah. doing criminal activity. So it's just a, you know, never ending web of shit. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, from what I gathered from that homicide detective, Steve Kaplan, because he worked that whole, Charles Caniglia case, they wanted him pretty bad. The government wanted to get him off the street because they knew he was a vicious killer. Yeah, and and that's just what I'm saying. I mean, if they knew he was like that, they're, they're going to get him for anything, no matter what yeah. it is. And I mean, like I said, they picked him up on that $400 extortion charge. And yeah. that was before all of it. But at that point, I mean, that's if they, like they did with Al Capone, man. If they can't get you for one thing, they'll get you something else. And they like yeah. they him for tax yeah. evasion, yeah. you know, and he got a lot of time for that. <laughs> but I was surprised that Peter Zaccaro flipped because yeah. he was a real tough guy, Peter. So we'll talk about him down the road, I'm sure. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, you know, the information that he had, it was probably after I had left the life in the 80s. They were they were pretty strong and and uh, you know whacking out a lot of people and Peter wanted to be a gangster and cozy up to Gotti and that's what he did, but eventually uh, he flipped. Yeah, I know he did. And then from what I read is because he just really seen Gotti bringing down the family, and being flashy, and you know he would tell you to do something, but he wouldn't do it himself. And he had a lot of resentment after that. He really did look up to him in the beginning, but then after yeah. the fact, he just mm-hmm. yeah. He's really upset, but no, we'll do to everyone watching. We'll do Peter Sicaro, Andrew Curro. How do you say his last name? Andrew Curro, yeah. Andrew Curro, and then we got uh, Roy DeMeo. So that's that. That's nine, and then we got one more that we're gonna do as well. So that'll be the ten. But I mean, there's more guys that we could always cover yeah. and talk about. But I mean, that's yeah. our little ten episode series. I mean, I just read yeah. Frank Lucas's book. We're gonna talk about him too. That you yeah. know him in prison. <laughs> yeah, he was an interesting guy. We'll talk about him. Yeah, well, <clears throat> thank you everyone for watching. We're going to switch over to Patreon now, but if you want to 
check out the Patreon exclusive videos. Just go over there because that's where we're going to offer videos that YouTube might take down. We don't really want to talk about these stories on here. So we're going to get t- tell another story about Charles Carniglia over there. So please go over there, subscribe if you want to get these little clips and these stories that can't be on here. And we'll see you on the next one. That wraps up the six mafia hitmen that Sal was close to, Charles Carniglia. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to get more videos like this. Also, please be sure to subscribe to our Patreon because we go on there and talk about stories that can't be talked about on YouTube. YouTube is very sensitive and they might take down particular videos, so we always go on Patreon with those. If you want to get an autographed copy of Sal's book, The Sinatra Club, please go to the video description. Also, if you want to buy the Sinatra Club playing cards, they're in the video description as well. At the end of this video, a playlist will pop up of all the other episodes that we've done in the past for this particular podcast. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.